In 28 days, I'm going to cover questions or topics related to selling your home. Welcome to 28 and 28. I'm the host of Real Estate Analysis with Donnie Weddle. You're watching episode 16. Today we're halfway through, actually one day past our halfway through mark on our 28 28 series. Today we're going to try something a little different. Uh, I'm going to be fielding live questions from you guys um, about what we want to discuss about selling your home. So, okay guys, I'm going to open it up for you. What are the questions coming in? Question is, should I buy a second home as an investment property with the home prices being so high at this time well am I Billy am I getting that right okay should I buy a second home as an investment property even though the market is at such high price if I understand your question correctly buying real estate in my mind there's always good deals on the market. You just have to find the good deals. Okay. Um, I'm an investor myself and to find a good deal. Sometimes, uh, it's simply talking with friends and family. You'll find that person that for lack of a better terminology needs to sell the home. Uh, you know, you, you've got folks that, uh, whether it be, let's just say, they are in dire circumstances and they need an outlet they need they need a lifeline a preserver a solution to solve their problem you can be that for them um, some folks the investors i work with uh, actually try to represent occasionally uh, they'll actually go out and find people who need to sell a home they'll purchase the home off of them and then they'll do a lease back so a person who possibly was about to lose their home because they could no longer afford it uh, and sell their home bank gets paid off the investor takes over the home makes minor repairs and people actually lease the home back off of it that doesn't happen often but uh, anyway. so to answer your question it depends Billy uh, it really depends on the situation uh, whether you come across a great investment or not um, buying one straight off the MLS with an agent um, at when it's a seller's market it's very difficult because right now we're actually in pretty much uh, we get in competitive situations so buying an investment property off the MLS while it's it can be done it, it gets difficult and the other thing is what's your long-term goal on that if you're looking at buying it just holding on to it for you know 10 15 years sure I mean the value of the property that you buy it at can be higher as an investment property than one let's say someone who's going to do a fix and flip because number one uh, okay I'll, let's go back to that lease back that I was talking about okay let's say that I run across someone and they're going into pre foreclosure boom I can help that person out I can as an investor I can help buy that property from them pay the bank off okay, all of a sudden they're no longer pre foreclosure they're no longer getting their credit deemed okay I work with them uh, to make sure that the rent payment is going to be affordable I mean if they were having a hard time paying their mortgage they could have a hard time paying the rent so that's something they got to understand uh, you want to work with them but you are it, you're now the new landlord and they've got to pay their bills but the thing that that works out great for someone is that wants to be a landlord is if they were living in a home that they owned um, they were a either couldn't afford to do any remodel or B were happy with the condition of the home so that's part of the thing you're gonna have a savings because you're gonna your understanding is when you lease it back to them they're gonna be living in that home in the condition that you bought it at. now there are certain standards uh, by by uh, you know HUD regulations and things of that nature that you have to do 
that to meet landlord standards. But I mean, you know, you're not going to go in the house and repaint and put new carpet in. I mean, they were okay living in that house with with the carpet and the paint the way it was. You're going to make sure you got a good roof on the home because that's going to protect your investment. You're going to make sure the air conditioning works. You're going to make sure that the electrical works and the plumbing works. Uh, but you know, if you have an ugly set of cabinets in the home, they've been living with that ugly set of cabinets. So you're going to have to go remodel and take care of that kind of thing. You're going to make sure that the home is mechanically uh, and structurally sound for them. Uh, but you're not going to have to do upgrades like you would if you're going to go buy a home typically, then do a remodel, clean it up, make it look nice, and then try to go rent it out. So there's a savings there for you, Billy. Yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Oh, okay, you've got a similar situation. Okay, that's great. Uh, so hopefully we answered that. But but that's key. It's number one, it's got to make sure that you can buy it and still rent it back to them at a value, at a price point they can afford so that you're not having to evict them or go through that process. Because remember, ultimately, you want to be a solution for that uh, that seller uh, and then that, that builds your rental portfolio. And now I what I would encourage you to do is... When you, if you do do a lease back with them, um, your lease back should probably be a month to month lease so that if they don't pay you, you do have quick and a fairly simple process of getting them out of the house, that type of thing. And you know, think about it, if you're gonna let them actually pay you a, probably less than, than what they were paying for the mortgage, uh, they need to understand that the end result is they gotta get back on track whether it be uh, you know, you know, many people over this past couple of years have they lost a job due to COVID or had someone that got sick and got medical bills. There needs to be a time frame that uh, they can be ready to do whatever. And then at some point, then you can even look at doing a lease purchase back to them if you wanted to. So it's a whole nother, whole nother uh, thing there. And so we, we really, we've touched on that too long. Billy, uh, uh, you've got my contact information. Give me a call. We'll actually sit down and talk through that a little bit more in detail, if you would. All right. Let's see what we got the next one. I apologize. My glasses, my eyes are a little bit tough, guys. Get some water here. All right. Uh, the next question is from Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Well, yeah, um, Margaret's question is deciding on paint colors. And it, in, and I forget my episode number right now off the top of my head, but in the episode, I talk about going to whites and creams and light grays and things of that nature. Um, you know, I'm, I know when everybody says, well, HGTV, the hot new trends, I want to really be cautious. Depending on where you're at in the country, is the trends of the colors around the country are different. I mean, you know, the exterior white with the black trim is hot, has been hot, the, the farmhouse type look, if you will. But keep in mind that uh, East Coast, West Coast, they may have already moved on past that. In my area here in the Midwest, we're still, I mean, there's still tons of homes being built today. Brand new homes being built are painted white with the black trim and then all of, and then all of our arena models uh, our last remodel that we just did um, was called Carbonized, and it's basically a dark charcoal, almost a black, and that was the main color of the home, and white trim was the color. So it was a ba basically just a flip of what the hot trend is, and everybody in the neighborhood just loved it because it was the only one there, and it really stood out uh, and made it look nice. Now, so just you need to look at what's selling uh, great in your neighborhood, and you know, Best way to do that is reach out to a local agent and talk with them, and they can tell you what's selling. Uh, now, can they predict what's going to be selling in a year or two? I, I can't say that. Now, that's on the exterior. Now, on the interior of their home, I'm, I'm a firm believer you can never go wrong with just doing soft whites because then you can bring in pops of color on your curtains and your pillows and your different things, and, and people don't have to buy different furniture when they're moving in if you're considering selling now if you're just wanting to know what's hot because you want to have a nice home that everybody likes then yeah jump out there and be trendy and go with what's going on the east coast and the west coast and you know they've got this great thing on your phone you, 
just type in Google and say, what are the hottest colors and trends in 2022? And it'll bring those things up for you. So, or uh, you can go to my Homekeeper uh, website and uh, they go through some things of that nature in there as well. So, but again, local real estate agents, they can tell you what hot trends are in colors because they see it every day as they're walking the houses. They get the feedback from the clients who are wanting to buy the houses. So, I mean, real estate agents are a great resource, Margaret, for anything you need to know about your home like that. Now, they're not expert, experts on construction. Well, some are, some aren't. You know, they're, some are experts on staging, things of that nature. I just tell you, if you want to know what feedback they get from clients today, many of them will share that with you. They'll even buy you a cup of coffee when, when you do that a lot of times. So, anyway. All right. I hope I answered your question, Margaret. Oh, let's see. Yeah, okay, great. That answered it. All right. That's awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more questions, guys, and we're going to close out this episode. Um, what else do we got here? All right. Give me another little drink of water. Bill. All right, Bill. How are things down in South Oklahoma? All right. Good, good here. All right. Uh, Bill's wanting to know, how do you go about discussing fence issues with neighbors? Well, you start off by, hopefully you've got a good relationship with your neighbor. If you don't, maybe this is a way to get a good relationship with your neighbor. Um. Fences are a, a different kind of topic. Um, on the uh, property dis disclosure form, when you're buying or selling a home, there's a line on there that talks about shared boundaries. I, I, I'm going blank on the exact uh, wording of it, but it discusses fences. And you, you have it has to be declared by the seller whether or not they're shared fences or not. You know, many people that I talk to, they don't have a clue if it's a shared fence or not. Um, so just have a go have a conversation with your neighbor. Uh, you know, if you have to long term, you can spend the money, get a surveyor out, survey where's the fence at, who's sat, you know. If it's on their property, it's their fence. If it's on your property, it's your fence. If it's kind of right there in the middle and crosses back and forth, and I mean some some people when they put a fence up, I was guilty of it. What I thought was my property, because well, I knew that. The old survey I had said it was this many feet. Well, we man, we didn't measure from the exact same starting point that the original surveyor did, so we got off by one or two feet. We weren't fighting over that piece of that land. Uh, we just want to make sure that we weren't encroaching on their property. Um, we didn't want to give up any of our property, but uh, we want to make sure we stayed on our property on our side. We had a great relationship with our neighbors, not an issue. Now, as those neighbors sell and move on, the next neighbor may have an issue. But just communicate with your neighbors and uh, and and that type of thing. Does that answer your question, Bill? Oh, okay. Bill wants to know. Um, let's say you have a fence that is in need of repair, and you think it's the neighbor's fence and it's falling over onto your property. Well, I had a client of mine that. Uh, wasn't a fence, it was a retaining wall. The retaining wall was letting tons and tons of, of sand and debris come through the retaining wall onto their property. Believe it or not, we had room to move almost a foot of just sand and fill and just dirt that had washed through the retaining wall. When we removed the foot of dirt down off their sidewalk, a couple months later, you know, we got a couple inches back, so we had to, we needed to put in a new retaining wall. And the neighbor, technically, that neighbor should have been in paying for about 50% of that retaining wall. And there's a, each state and county, they're a little different. You can actually go to your county websites and state websites and stuff, and they talk about ownership and percentage of ownership and that type of thing. And so, I would, again, I just encourage you to talk with that neighbor. If you're like my client was and the, the dirt from his yard, the, the neighbor's yard is ending up in your yard, at some point they're going to have big holes in their yard. So they'd be 
kind of uh, would hopefully it would benefit them to help kick in some of the money to repair the retaining wall itself. If yours is a fence, well, you know, who needs the fence? It's the fence because it's trying to keep in your dog or their dog. Those are the things you got to think about. I mean, if you don't have a dog and the fence is falling down in your yard, you can be, you can be neighborly and, and offer to help him rebuild the fence on a weekend. I wouldn't spend any money on it, but I'd have him remove his fence off my property nicely. I mean, there's all that, guys. You can, what's the old saying? You can get a lot more with honey than you can, than you can vinegar. So, uh, and there's, there's something that goes about being neighbor, you know, uh, just as my client was. They didn't ask the neighbor to pay for any of the retaining fence, the, excuse me, the retaining wall. And then, now when we had to, when we had the contractor install the new retaining wall, guess what? The fence that was above the retaining wall had to be removed so we could put the retaining wall up. Well, when the fence was down, the contractor nicely put it on the neighbor's property. The neighbor inquired about what are we going to do about the fence, and I explained to him, said, well, I sure hope you put a nice pretty one up. That one was a little bit old and, and getting a little deteriorated. And sure enough, guess what? They were so appreciative that the retaining wall was done at no cost to them. They put the new fence up. Didn't ask him, didn't ask for a penny of for the fence. So worked out great because we had good communication back and forth. We made the gentleman aware aware of when we were going to do it, how it was going to happen, what it was going to look like. And ultimately we even put got permission when we had to dig the, the dirt away to put the new retaining wall in and did the backfill. We even sawed it back onto his property about I think five or six feet uh, on the on the hill there, if you will. So he, was, he wasn't losing dirt anymore, and he was very tickled for that. So just work with a neighbor. Uh, you know, now not, all, not all neighbors are reasonable. I understand that. But if you, if you can't come to a conclusion together, then you may have to bring in a professional to help with that, being either a mediator or a lawyer or something of nature. You hate to do that, but may All right, we're going to take one more. Bill, I hope that answers your question. All right. Let's see here. I got it. Oh, there's two or three here. Let me see. All right. What do I think about Zillow? Guys, this is supposed to be about selling your home. You're not going to sell your home with Zillow. Now, Zillow's got their home buyer situation where they'll come buy your home off of you for X dollars and, and, just, and just like guys you're going to if you haven't got them you're going to get them you're going to get letters in the mail from investors that'll that will offer to buy your house I may be mailing you a letter that uh, will offer to buy your house um, I don't do typically I don't just do the random thing where you can buy a list and send out hundreds of hundreds of envelopes with you know pre-printed letters to people I do send out letters myself and I'm getting off topic. You want to know about Zillow, but let me. I want to finish talking about that because I'm actually going to be completing a round of letters this afternoon. Um, when I mail a letter out to a client, or excuse me, back up to a potential seller. So let's say I drive down the street, and you know, okay, Chip and Joanna, or uh, Torque and Chris, uh, whatever her name is, and Flip or Flop. You know, they say, oh, the worst house on the street. Well, that's kind of what I do. When I drive down the street, uh, if I see a home that's in in need of repair, you know, it's it's ugly. Uh, it's overgrown bushes and all that. I may mail that homeowner uh, a letter. And that's got some of those I'm going to be doing second. A letter letting him know that I'm interested in buying that property. Now, as a real estate agent, I've already done my due diligence. I know uh, when they bought it, how long they've owned it, um, is it vacant, is it not vacant, uh, is it a rental, um, what the taxes are on it, if they owe a mortgage, things of that nature. So I want to go about that educated because I don't want to just be wasting my time sending letters to somebody, bugging the crap out of them. I want to send some to someone that could potentially, A, number one, want to sell that property, and be one that I can afford to buy and see one that I know that when I put my investment into it, I can turn around and then sell it or 
add it to a rental portfolio. So, uh, so yes, I like to send letters out. Um, I don't send out a ton. I typically will, will select 10 properties um, at a time that I will go after and try to purchase off of a, off of a homeowner or sometimes they're trust more than more than homeowners uh, someone had passed away and left it to the trust and many times they're out of state that type of thing and that's how they get a lot of homes if you got a home in your neighborhood that's in disrepair if you live in a nice neighborhood a lot of times it, somebody you probably know somebody lived there and they passed away and the the heirs live out of state and don't either don't have the money to come back and take care of it aren't interested in it whatever so Anyway, you know, there are a lot of real estate agents that will go represent and take care of all that for you. They'll do that door knocking and that phone call and that type of thing. So ask your real estate agents. They can help you with that as well. If you can't find one that will help you with that, call me. I can promise you I can find someone, no matter where you're at in the United States, that will help you with going and making contact and trying to buy that property. I'll put my contact information in the link for that so down in the comments or the details if you have a property that you would like a real estate agent to help you go try to buy hit me up i'll get you set up with someone no matter whether you're in florida north dakota oklahoma you name it i'm actually connected to a network of uh, of agents all across the country and i if I don't know someone in your particular town, I know someone who will know that person. So anyway, I want to get back and answer Margaret's question real quick. What are my thoughts on Zillow? Well, I, as I said, and I kind of got off on my letters about because the Zillow and I forget, I don't know if they're the open door guys or what they are, but they'll come make you an offer. As far as setting the price of your home, Let's all right. Let's let me let me go back. What do most people use Zillow for? They use Zillow to help them be a search engine to find houses that are listed on the market. Every Keller Williams agent has an app that'll do the same thing. If they can, so they can share an app with you, believe it or not, that you can drive around and okay, driving down the street here, see a for sale sign. Man, I'd like to know how much that is. You pull out your phone. Your GPS is on your phone. Boom, it'll bring up that house right there on your phone, that agent's app. You can say you like that. You can ask your agent to set up a showing. Everything right there on the app. It sends it back to them. They know what you want to do, that type of thing. Uh, there are some mortgage companies that have apps that are very similar. And then there are other companies, not just Keller Williams, that have that same type of app. So, so you're, now I would tell you, the accuracy of the apps from the mortgage company and the real estate companies are more accurate than the Zillow numbers you're going to see. Many times, uh, well, now if it's listed, Zillow should be correct. And of course, at Realtor.com, they've got they've got an app that you can do mobile app as well. Not talking bad about any of their apps. I'm just saying one advantage is if you've had a face-to-face -face conversation with me and I've shared my app with you and it's downloaded onto your phone you don't have to pick up the phone calling but whatever you, you when you're touching the buttons on my on your app my app on your phone it's letting me know that and I'm gonna pick up the phone and call you that afternoon and say okay what time when and where we're gonna look at it and that type of thing we're on Zillow you tell you want to talk to an agent who knows they're selling that your data to an agent out there who's buying that some of you have you may not have that meshing relationship with so if you have a relationship with an agent get their app on your phone don't mess with Zillow from that aspect now if you just want to see what what is hitting the market that's great but most agents can set you up a home search through the MLS automatically so when something hits the market boom it hits right to you on your phone or on your laptop whatever as well um, and on the algorithms, the, the way they price your Zestimate, again, I am not talking bad about it. I'm just going to give you the, that everything Zillow offers, your agent that you have a, a personal relationship with 
has that. You don't need Zillow. Just talk and communicate with your agent. Many of you may find that. Some people tell me that they find that Zillow get, can opens things up because you get to see for sale by owners. And that's probably true. For sale by owner doesn't hit me as an agent because I'm only getting populated from the MLS. So that is one advantage of, of Zillow because people do list their for sale by owners on there. However, in today's market world, it's buying from a for sale by owner can be a little more difficult than it used to be. And that's a whole nother topic. But um, my only challenge with, with these estimates are it's an it's a algorithm, a computer telling you what your home is worth. For someone who's never walked in the door, that computer's never been in your home. It's never drove down your street. It doesn't know that there's a one of the houses that your home is being compared to has got a, a power plant in the backyard or something of that nature. So a local expert, being that local real estate agent, will give you a lot better detail price that you need for your home or comparable prices. So again, not talking bad about it. It's got its place. It's just not around me to set my pricing or make contacts with my, my customers. So anyway. I've get, man, I've talked and uh, answered a lot of questions here. I hope I haven't rattled on too much. This is the first 28, and 3, 28 series that I've just answered live questions. I've been fielding questions and answering them as topics. So uh, we may do this again at the end of the 28 and 28 series. Um, I'll, as always, I'll put some information, links, and contact details and all that in the details or in the comments, uh, if you've got a question and uh, would like to know, please put it in the comments on the bottom of this video, uh, whether it be on Facebook or whether it be on uh, YouTube uh, or some of my other platforms I'm using. So anyway, I'll, as always, I want to thank you for watching Real Estate Analysis with Donnie Weddle.